All right, everybody. All right, everybody, welcome. <clears throat> welcome to episode number <clears throat> 200. <clears throat> oh, my God. <clears throat> welcome to episode number 255 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Today is December 6th. It's a Tuesday, everybody. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Ocean. Over the next 45 minutes, I'll probably curtail it to 30 for expediency. I'll be deliver delivering the top cybersecurity news stories of the day and providing my expert analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner, so how can you operationalize it? Or if you're looking to break into the industry, we got you covered. But before we get into that, shout out and thanks to the stream sponsor, Barricade Cyber Solutions. Boom. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recovering from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows what's up and knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Go to barricadecyber.com to talk to Eric Taylor and the whole gang over there. Have a plan, y'all. Look at this is their website. You just scroll down. Eric's calendar's right here. Two clicks and you got a meeting with him. Talk about your business. It's uh, no obligation, guys. It's just, you know, setting it up so you know what's going on. Also want to give some love to Recon Infosec, Eric Capuano and the whole gang over there. If your organization is large enough, if your organization is large enough to have real cybersecurity concerns, but maybe not quite large enough to build a full-fledged SecOps capability from the ground up, check out the Managed Detection and Response MDR offering from Recon InfoSec. Their offering includes the people, process, and tech needed to deliver full-spectrum SecOps to organizations of any size. Here's the deal, guys. If you need someone watching the wire, watching your endpoints, looking for bad, threat hunting, telling you what's up, letting you sleep easy at night, this is what MDR does, and that's what Recon InfoSec does. They are a security company led by security people very talented group over there mdr is a great financially prudent uh option for businesses i want to remind you if you hold professional certs like sysp sysa system each episode of the daily cyber threat briefing is worth half a cpe so two and a half a week 10 a month they stack up everybody so be sure to document literally the easiest and i would argue the most enjoyable way to earn cpes just say what's up in chat hashtag team live hashtag Jerry, what took you so long? Hashtag BSEC, thanks for being a TA and keeping everybody in order. Hashtag, how many minutes were you all gonna wait before you stormed out and said it was counted for credit? Now, listen, if you're live, love it. I know we started a little late. There's a hundred of you here right now. Thank you for being here. Some of my Citadel students are in chat. What's up, Citadel? Appreciate it. If you're on replay, appreciate you catching the stream. Hashtag team replay. Yaren, thanks for the squad membership. If you want to jump right to the news team replay, just jump ahead. No big deal. I'm going to spend just 30 seconds because I started late this morning saying what's up to people in chat. And then you can bet your bottom dollar. We are going to be jumping right into the top news of the day. Let me get rid of this. Everybody, good morning. Hey, what's up, Tom Bishop? Um, Matthew Hibbert. I saw, uh, oh God, like Windwalker or Sandwalker, someone like that talking. David Beard, what's up? Haircut Fish. Come back Thursday for Haircut Fish's meme of the week. Always a good time. Hey, Carrie, good to see you. Tom Hathcoat, good to see you, man. Good morning to you. Guys, get your coffee on. Doink, doink, doink. Got my coffee. Got my coffee. I'm going to take one slug and get right into the news. Mm. What's a reference to tomorrow? I'm not sure. Good morning, Seth. Cyber Munchkin, Shane Prevost, what's up? Stormwalking, there you are. Yeah, okay, I was close, dude. I was close. Good to see you, Junior Ola. Jeff Watala with the coffee. Jenny Housley, another awesome showing by Jenny Housley yesterday on the World of Haiku streams. Thanks, Jenny. All right, guys, let's get into the news. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Tuesday, December 6, 2022. Vulnerabilities found in popular baseboard software. Researchers at Eclipsium Research disclosed three vulnerabilities in the Mega Rack Baseboard Management Controller software from American Megatrends. These BMCs operate their own firmware, memory, and networking stack within a server, offering admins remote access to manage them. Many server OEMs use this baseboard software, including AMD, Dell, 
ARM, Asus, HPE, Huawei, Lenovo, and Qualcomm. Actually, exploiting the vulnerabilities varies. Some require prior access to at least a low-privilege account, and then others need remote access. Ultimately, these can be used to deploy malware or ransomware and cause physical damage to servers. No word if threat actors actively target the vulnerabilities. All right, real quick, Benjamin Shine, thanks for the super chat. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Makes me want to take a slug off the old coffee, Benjamin. Let me get that real quick. Hmm. All right, guys. So you probably like this isn't mainstream because this this type of tech isn't um, marketed towards. Oh, thanks, Reggie. Upgrade into the squad membership. Enjoy that. Now, listen, guys, um, baseboards uh, software, like basically accessing uh, motherboards or, you know, uh, like in data centers and stuff like that. This is for IT people. This isn't your consumer grade stuff. But as they mentioned, this BMC um, Mega Rack Baseboard Management Controller, a.k.a. BMC from American Megatrends. It's quite popular. Jeremy Williams with the super chat. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Now you're going to overload me on the coffee. Okay, so check it out. Here's the deal. Not not marketed towards consumers, but that it is quite popular. And because it's not really, I feel like it's a niche market. Um, this group runs uh, runs the show. Like they, it's it's used in most tech, right? They said Dell. They said Huawei. They said, you know, these major players. Now, here's the deal with this. It allows remote access for uh, admins to be able to manage, right? Because when you have a bunch of tech, huge data center, think of like an AWS data center or Google data center, right? You're not going to have some admin walking up to all of these machines and pulling up a KVM switch uh, or, you know, a, a console and, and getting into that. No, they want to be like Carl, IT engineer Carl wants to sit comfortably at his desk and uh, or remote in from his place in Houston, right? So they want to take it easy. Now, these vulnerabilities could allow, I guess, for remote acts uh, for a security compromise. They do point out that some of these things are often misconfigured, you know, and, and can lead to security issues. My, my thing is, if this was like remote code execution, no auth, uh, like anonymous, uh, anonymously access remote code auth, no, no authentication required. That would be serious. But I'll, I'll just point this out. This is an interesting story because it points out that this type of software can have vulnerabilities, which is obvious, right? All software does. But dude, a lot of times these machines in the data centers, they're not looking like you're not, you'd have to, this would be strung together with other attacks. Like the, the, the baseboard remote access thing isn't going to be exposed to the internet. If it was, that would be absolutely horrible. It would be interesting to do a Shodan search and see if any of these are out there. But for the most part, they're not. So, um, you know, uh, this is interesting. Again, if you work in a data center, if you work in a situation where you'd actually be remoting into these boards uh, to manage them, keep them up to date, you know, validate them, audit them, whatever, then you should be uh, looking at it, but for the most part, for me, the, you know, this is not this is not a story that I have anything to do with. It's more situational awareness. Chinese threat groups stole COVID nineteen relief funds, according to information from the Secret Service. The Chinese linked APT forty one stole at least twenty million dollars in COVID relief benefits. These came in the form of small business administration loans and unemployment insurance funds across over a dozen states. The Secret Service also said it maintains over 1,000 ongoing investigations into criminal actors defrauding public benefits programs. It's unclear how many of these investigations link back to foreign threat groups, but NBC News' sources say other investigations point to state-backed actors. Security researchers say APT41, a.k.a. Wicked Panda, generally focuses on gathering personally identifiable information for cyber espionage. All right. Two things here. One... Um, you know, I am from Boston. Y'all know that like the fact that it's wicked Panda, I think is wicked. Awesome. Like way to get wicked up in there. Um, I do use wicked as often as I can, uh, unconsciously. So check it out. Chinese threat actors stole $20 million. They, they talk about, um, they said whether APT 41 was used or not. I don't know. Here's the deal. I, I I'm not, I'm not downplaying this. Okay. This sucks, but it's $20 million. Okay. And if, if you remember how much money went out the door, $872 billion. So $20 million, that's like one of these like Facebook GDPR fines that we talk about. Like it's, it's not really, it doesn't even show up in the ledger as a percentage point. Okay. So 
again, I'm not downplaying $20 million. That's still fraud and it's still terrible. But for $872 billion, $20 million isn't really doing anything. Also, I want to point out, um, they talked about 20% of the $870 billion was kind of like tied up in like what appeared to be fraud and, and stuff like that. Guys, you know what's terrible? Like whenever there's money, Great cash, homie. whenever there's money, criminals are going to see it as an opportunity. It is as old as human, you know, civilization, right? People, you know, doing criminal stuff because the opportunity's there, right? Not everybody's a good person. So the fact that China was doing it, okay, like, you know, like everybody had their hand in the cookie jar. Every, but not every, like all of us didn't, but you know what I'm saying? Like, as soon as it came out, they, they rushed out COVID relief money. They didn't have a lot of guardrails in place. They didn't have a lot of, um, um, you know, checks and balances and stuff like that because they were trying to get the money into people's hands so they could pay their rent, feed their kids, you know, whatever. And it was, it was, it, it you could have told, you could like, you could tell from jump street, it was going to be for, you know, a, a hotbed of fraudulent activity. So you know, again, I hate to say this, y'all. I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. Like this story right here, it might be true, but I also feel like this is, I don't want to call it propaganda, but this is like stoking the fires of like, uh, like China's, uh, you know, China's an enemy. China's an adversary. Like, you know, when we start doing more sanctions, more economic, you know, we're not selling chips to them anymore. Huawei's not being sold here anymore. Like the more of that, like this, this is to help, <laughs> in my opinion, help soften the the mentality and the approach that China bad, right? That because I mean, dude, twenty million dollars again, it's 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 significant, right? Twenty million dollars would change my life, but in the grand scheme of fraud with COVID relief, twenty million doesn't move the needle. So, you know, what's the what's the point, right, of of this story? So again, cynical Jerry, you know, whatever. The question of AI generated code. The popular coding Q&A site Stack Overflow temporarily banned users from sharing responses generated by OpenAI's ChatGPT. The mods say the chatbot makes it easy to flood the site with responses that have a high rate of being incorrect, despite looking correct at first glance. Given that the site operates with volunteer moderators, the ban serves to reduce the volume to keep human review possible. Stack Overflow will make a final ruling on ChatGPT usage after consulting with its community. All right, y'all, this is going to melt everyone's face. Okay, so there's like two things going on right now. Very meta, not Facebook meta, but like meta in our industry in InfoSec. And I think it's greater like text space, but whatever. Open lens and these like graphics, uh, these pictures of people um, th getting all sorts of funny um, like AI drawn uh, pictures. I don't know if you guys have seen these yet. Like I, I did it myself. Um, it's kind of funny. I'll just show it to you. I did my wife as well. Hey, okay, so let, let's do this really quick. I just want to show you this, guys, right? I don't know if you've seen these. Hold on, wait. Have you seen these? Have you seen these yet? Right? So, like, that is one thing that's going on. The second thing is this um, open, sh open AI chat GPT. People are posting all sorts of crazy stuff online. This is a major news story right now. And I'm going to show you an example. It's it's basically, you know, like every other machine learning chat AI, but people are using it to write scripts, people are using it to answer questions, people are using it for marketing copy, and apparently people are using it to answer questions on Stack Overflow. I will tell you this, the the moderators at Stack Overflow are like, "No, it's, you know, you're going to be pushing bad information." Possibly, but I'll tell you what, based on what I have seen, the the chatbot's pretty good. And let's do like this is I didn't know this story was coming. I actually have the chatbot up right now because I hot linked to it because I found it so unbelievably insanely powerful that I actually you can see here I marked it secret weapon on my on my browser bar. Watch this. Write 600 words on why Jerry Osier was late to the threat briefing this morning in a playful style. Right? Let me see. Cybersecurity threat briefing in a playful style. Watch this, guys. Ready? Just wrote the question. Just made it up. Doink. Now watch this. 
Jerry was late to the cybersecurity threat briefing for a number of reasons. First of all, he overslept. He had stayed up late this night watching a thrilling game of football, which was true, right? Last night, Tampa Bay versus New Orleans. Despite the challenge he faced, Jerry was determined to make the most of the briefing. He borrowed a laptop from a colleague. Like, this is almost a fantasy story, but you get the idea. Like, this right here, this just got generated. That's 600 words, and it's a complete explanation of why I didn't show up today. It's not true, but you get the idea. What about this? Write 600, write 500 words on how to become a SOC analyst in 2023 in a playful style. I like this. In a playful style. Boink. Watch this. You want to see my next YouTube video? Watch this. Become a SOC analyst in 2023 is no easy feat, but it's definitely doable if you're willing to put in the work. Here are a few steps to follow. Start by brushing up your cybersecurity skills. Get certified. Gain experience. Network, network, network. Cybersecurity field's all about connections. Number five, stay up to date. Become a SOC analyst in 2023 might like seem like a daunting task, but with hard work, dude, I might even just post this as a blog post on my website. This is what's going on right now. And this is why people are losing their mind um, about open chat uh, or open AI, it, open AI's chat GPT because it's doing things like this in seconds. Do you see what I'm saying? Look at this. I'm, I'm just going to copy this and put it. I, I can't put this in chat. I will post this as a blog post later just so you guys can see what's up. But like, this is crazy, okay? Anyways, I, I so the example of why I didn't go to, uh, why I was late for class was a completely fictitious story and not factually true. This right here, I'm just reading it quickly, skimming it. This is all true. And by the way, I say network, network, network all the time. That's not even like a SOC analyst skill. That's a general cybersecurity field skill. This is all true, right? So... Anyways, that, that's what's going on there. So get some of that. All right, let's get into Hunter Biden's laptop. Twitter leaks emails on Hunter Biden laptop decision. Journalist Matt Taby published a tweet thread detailing how Twitter's trust and safety team determined to temporarily block a 2020 New York Post story involving the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop ahead of the U.S. presidential election. Twitter provided emails to Taby, which showed the team debating whether to restrict links to the story under its hacked materials policy. Emails show concern from some trust and safety staff that the story details appeared consistent with recent Russian influence operations. The emails do not show CEO Jack Dorsey involved in the decision. He subsequently reversed the block. Taby said he did not see evidence of any government involvement in the laptop story. The emails largely agree with recent statements on the decision from Twitter's former head of trust and safety, Yoel Roth. And now... All right, so I haven't been following this story too closely. Um, I know that like Hunter's laptop is all up in up in the space. Um, you know, I, guys. Okay, so a couple things, right? So um, Twitter released the emails uh, of, you know, this documentation was giving to a reporter instead of just releasing the data itself um, to see like what the inner turmoil was with Twitter, you know, I don't know if that was for spin purposes or not. I don't know. I mean, I know what uh, Elon's political uh, angles are, but I don't know if he's couching things or, or releasing it in a certain way to shape a certain narrative. I will tell you this. Um, if you're interested in the Hunter Biden laptop story, look into it. If you're not, then it's like a non-story. Guys, I, I feel like... I only speak for myself, but like I'm... I, I, I'm almost apathetic to like the Biden laptop story or like Trump's tax returns. Like it's just, can we, can we like, can we, can we focus on like recession, inflation, jobs, you know, like our economy? Like I, I just, I don't care about the squabblings of the, you know, I, I don't want to call them like royalty, but it, it, it just, it just feels like a different, it's like the caste system and the people who are up there arguing about stuff that the rest of us don't really care about because it's not, it's not a priority right now. So anyways, uh, now that Elon's in charge of Twitter, they can do things like this. So look for more, you know, whatever Elon's whole thing was, um, transparency and, and, uh, you know, free speech and all this stuff. So, you know, we'll see how it goes, but Again, not a real cybersecurity story as far as I'm concerned. It's much more a political story on and policy story on what to be released and how do these social media platforms that have a clear societal impact, how do they make decisions on what gets released, what gets censored? Again, guys, 
In 2022, big tech companies have as much power and control, frankly, as some nation states. I mean, Jesus. Elon has his own communication method, his own space program, right? You know, he's got a lot of uh, power that a lot of countries don't have. Word from our sponsor, PlexTrack. Oh, here we go. The PlexTrack platform is your offensive security team's secret weapon. Build better reports in half the time, centralize your data, maximize your reusable content, and become more efficient and effective. PlexTrack clients report a five times ROI in one year, a 30% increase in efficiency, have cut their reporting cycle by 65%, and experienced an 18 to 22% time savings per engagement. Check out PlexTrack.com slash CISO series to learn how PlexTrack can help your team deliver results. That's P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C dot com slash CISO series. All right, here Case we go. Case dismissed against... Real quick. Real quick. I mean, it wouldn't be a show if I didn't play it, right? All right, really quick. Just want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I, I did show up late today. I appreciate y'all granting me grace. I had some, um, some Citadel uh, obligations to commit to. We will be doing the show 8 a.m. every single day until the um, spring semester starts. If you are getting value from the stream, the best way to say thank you is to take five seconds and hit the like button. It does make a difference for the way that YouTube uh, promotes Simply Cyber to people who have yet to discover what we're doing over here. Thank you to Barricade Cyber Solutions and Recon InfoSec for their continued support of the channel. Uh, and allowing me to do the things that I love to do and connect with all of you. I'll just really quick, if you want the newsletter, go to simplycyber.io slash newsletter, sign up. I send you an email every single Monday morning with actionable intel that you can leverage. Wick it, wick it quickly, okay? All right, Leonardo with the physical pen test. All right, let's keep going. Get to the uh, other end of the news here. Against Huawei CFO. U.S. District Judge Ann Donnelly in Brooklyn dismissed an indictment against Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou, which alleged her of crimes related to misleading banks about Huawei's relationship with a company operating in Iran. Canadian authorities arrested Meng in December 2018, and she remained under house arrest during the case. Meng reached an agreement with U.S. prosecutors last year for the case to be dismissed four years after her initial arrest, acknowledging she made false statements about Huawei's Iran business. The case was dismissed with prejudice, so it cannot be brought again. Meng flew home to Shenzhen following the dismissal. Okay, guys. <laughs> like, again, with all due respect, this is not a cybersecurity story. It's a bigger... It's a, I mean, Huawei is interesting because it's Chinese-backed, and there's been su some suspicions around the integrity of Huawei devices. We just saw recently that the United States put a ban on, I want to say selling Huawei and a couple of other products in the United States because of national security surveillance concerns. Again, like I hate to sound like a freaking um, chicken little or something like this, but this is another like, ooh, like, ugh, like US China attention, like, uh, you know, like, I mean, I get it. She got arrested. There was some concern around China, Iran actions. I don't know if it had to do with economic sanctions, diplomatic issues, whatever. But this woman was uh, basically under house arrest for four years. I'm sure she continued to be a CFO um, for Huawei from her house. I mean, everybody was, I mean, COVID was like work from home central. So, you know, whatever. But again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because from a, from, from a day to day cybersecurity perspective, this has nothing there's no value here. FreeBSD fixes ping flaw. The ping utility remains a staple among the networking toolkit. It uses the internet control message protocol to let an admin check if a computer remains online. Reply packets from network computers contain IPv4 packet headers, which typically contain 20 bytes in total that include a device's IP address. The free BSD version of ping allocated fixed size buffers on the stack where the IP header would reside. But since the header can contain any value that can exceed 20 bytes, it triggers a stack buffer overflow inside ping for larger headers. This remains rare, but FreeBSD issued a security advisory stating it may be possible for a malicious host to trigger remote code execution in ping. Risk of exploitation remains limited, given that the utility runs in a capability mode sandbox that constrains how it interacts with the system and doesn't run as root. 
The latest version of FreeBSD 12 and 13 fixed the issue. Well, this is cool. So Ping of Death, uh, to take it way back, um, Ping of Death. This is like a classic, you know, um, if you don't know what Ping of Death is, and I'm probably going to explain it wrong, but it's basically back in the day, um, meaning, you know, the 90s, you could send a ping like, you know, we all know what ping is, right? And if you don't, like you basically open a shell or a terminal screen or a command prompt or whatever, and you type in ping in an IP address and it sends one packet to that IP address and pings back. It tells you if a machine's up. It is a classic first step when you're troubleshooting network issues. Like, oh, I'm trying to go to the website. It's not up. Can you ping it? Right? That's what they say. And then, no, I can't ping it. All right. Well, can you ping can you ping, is it you or is it the website? So then you ping yourself. Yes, I can ping myself. Can I ping my gateway router? Yes, I can ping my gateway router. Can I ping a different website like Google? Yes. All right, it's definitely their website. It's troubleshooting 101. But um, ping, and by the way, I believe ping is done differently on Linux and uh, Windows machines the way it's implemented, but it doesn't use, uh, it uses ICMP protocol, which is different than TCP or UDP. And once you like really get into the protocols, a lot of us don't get deep into the weeds on the protocol, but like when you actually look at the protocol, the way that computers agree to talk and use the protocols, like ICMP protocol, right? Um, there's flags, there's fixed buffer, like, okay, the ping packet's going to be this long. Well, you can be a peckerhead and you can send a, um, a ping so I get confused between ping of death and teardrop attack, but basically there's a way I think ping of death is like you ping, but you change the, the, the source IP to be the same IP as the machine itself. So then it starts pinging itself and it basically exhausts all the resources. I believe that's ping of death. There's also, but again, like all you have to do is configure the protocol, uh, to, to, or configure the endpoint to not allow that to happen. You can also, the the mushroom attack, I think it's called, or the smurf attack is another one where like you say that the packet is longer than the actual uh, header allows for the ICMP protocol for that ping. And then when the receiving end tries to process the ping request, it basically chokes and throws up on itself and, and, and collapses. So look up ping of death and smurf attack, I believe are the two, um, the two. Yeah. I might be getting it wrong, but, or teardrop attack. Thank you. Teardrop. That's what I'm getting wrong. The thing is like, they're almost like, uh, they're almost like historical references, like the Morris worm or something like that, because these type of attacks don't work normally in the modern era because operating systems that are quite popular, like windows, Mac OS X, Red Hat, Linux, whatever they they've already accounted for and dealt with this ping of death attack. So you don't see it anymore. It's almost like nostalgic or like a Jeopardy question, right? But apparently this free BSD operating system, they hadn't, uh, they hadn't addressed it, right? So what's old is new again, but anyways, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. Um, so just be mindful of it. Yeah, so here, here are the flags, right? So this type 08 that, again, it, without getting too into it, it's binary, right? So you can have... 000, 001, 0010, right? Like it's binary. And type eight is just basically a flag to say it's ICMP echo. Type zero, ICMP echo reply. Um, and you have the thing ping itself to death, basically. Okay. All right. It's cool. Little complex suspends operations after ransomware. France's health ministry announced that the hospital center of Versailles suspended medical operations after a ransomware attack over the weekend, transferring at least six patients. More transfers will occur in what is described as a total reorganization of the hospital. The center contains two hospitals and a retirement home, all currently without working computer systems. While critical medical care machines remain operational, the shutdown of the system's internal network meant staff could not adequately monitor patients. French police named Lockbit as the party behind the attack, with the group posting staff and patient data on its leak site. Yeah, that sucks. Okay, so Lockbit right now is a major threat actor in the um, ransomware space. So, you know, know that name. Be mindful of that name. Maybe even if, you, if you've if you done the basics to protect yourself from generic ransomware, consider, especially if you work in a hospital, uh, consider looking at the TTPs for Lockbit. 
consider contacting Barricade Cyber and making sure that you have a, kind of a incident response um, approach to getting hit with Lockbit. Um, it sucks that they hit a hospital. Um, you guys got to remember, like a hospital has IT infrastructure and people running around, and then they have a bunch of um, medical devices, medical equipment that typically is IT enabled because a lot of the vendors remote in and manage it. A lot of the telemetry, or not telemetry, but a lot of the data points, like you hook me up to a machine, right? And it's push, it's taking my vitals and it's it's reporting it to the nurses station at the middle of the hospital or whatever, right? So when when you get hit with ransomware and these things start to break, those don't work anymore. The patient's not getting killed, right? But you can't monitor that their heart hasn't stopped, for example, right? Like the, the network traffic isn't getting back to the nurse's station because the nurse's station is ransomware, right? Maybe the network traffic's getting there, but the applications that they need to run are now encrypted and they can't use them. So this is a massive uh, issue. Obviously they started transferring people away. You gotta remember too, like this, this doesn't just impact patient care. Like a hospital, at least in the United States, it might be different in France, in, in the United States, right? Like healthcare system, you need scheduling, right? You don't just walk in for a procedure. You need scheduling. And then the whole billing and insurance and all that is an entire workflow and, and tons of people have to work on that at the hospital. So if all your systems are down, you don't know who's coming. The, the physicians and clinicians may be able to do the procedure or give you health care, but you can't bill them, which you know that's going to hurt for the hospital. You can't keep track of what you did. You can't document it in the patient medical record, which is required by law. So there's a lot of impact by hitting a hospital, not just to patient safety and patient health care, but to the actual operation of the hospital. Um, so uh, I would see hospitals wanting to pay the ransom quickly because it is incredibly impactful from a financial perspective. Open SSF. There are not free health. Like as far as I know, other people can chat in on this. There is no free healthcare in the United States. It's all, dude, there's some horrible stories, Dennis, of people who are, you know, I want to say um, lack financial stability, you know, don't have access to healthcare that like, there's been stories where like, I've like, it's terrible, but like, so someone like goes to get into a subway and they slip and their leg falls in between the, 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 the sidewalk and the subway. And then the subway pinches their leg and like, you know, they're pinned. And then they like a bunch of people, it's a heroic story. A bunch of people push the subway to the side and someone drags them out. And this person's leg is all mangled. And what they're saying is they're screaming in pain and agony. They're crying, but it's not because their leg is damaged. They're screaming, do not call an ambulance. Do not call. Don't take me to a hospital. And it's because they don't want to rack up the 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 financial burden associated with that it's awful it is awful it's new members the open source security foundation operates under the linux foundation bringing together various projects around software supply chain security it announced new members across a wide swath of the industry now bringing its total members to over 100. new members include docker hacker one qualys control plane and amd xilinx Open SSF announced the new members at its Open SSF Day Japan at the Open Source Summit in Yokohama. Hmm. This week on the season. All right. Well, that's really cool. All right. So I'll just make this really quick. Guys, if you've been following that, this is kind of like an industry trend. If you've been following open source software, um, there have been, you know, several uh exploits, threat actors dumping in malicious code into known good repos. Um you know, over just straight up writing uh, malicious repos and naming them so they get pulled down. There's all sorts of things around open source software. And the U.S. government has been making a push. Private sector, like big players like Google, Amazon, Microsoft have been making financial investments and moving towards more secure open source software. This is more of the same open SSF membership welcoming um, new businesses uh, new members into it. You could see here, Docker is getting in there, which is awesome. Uh, AMD, Xlinux, Trail a bit. So like Qualys, big players, guys. Um, this is really good. I think in five years, we're going to look back and be like, I can't believe that we allowed software to get baked into products 
um, without having any of these security controls or any of this audit, any of this visibility. Wow. We were really running, you know, running, um, what's the word? Not running naked, but running um, wild and loose. So look, this is another uh, macro trend in our industry around developing uh, open source secure software. So appreciate that. Again, it's not a story for um, operationalizing today, but it is important to understand and know. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today's stream. Let me do this. I want to thank you all for being here today. I know I started late, but hopefully you got some value from the news. I certainly enjoyed it. I, I Like I said, I will be doing 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the foreseeable future. Stay tuned for updates as that changes. Uh, I did see some people push back or you know share some concern, maybe Gail, um, around it being 5 a.m. In, in West Coast, 3 a.m. in Hawaii. Uh, I want to um, let everyone know. So I live in the Eastern time zone. I am a security practitioner. I start my day off, very first you know thing of my day, I get my coffee and I consume the daily threat briefing. It's how I work. It's how I do my day. Like I, like I was doing this before I went live for years prior, right? So I just decided to hit record one day. I've tried doing it later in the day and it doesn't work because I get into my workflows and then I stop to do the briefing, but the briefing helps me inform me on my daily workflows. So it has to be the first thing I do in the day. And the only reason it was 10 a.m. on Tuesday and Thursday is because I teach at the Citadel Tuesdays and Thursdays, and that class is at 8 a.m. So I get my coffee, go to the Citadel, teach, and then I start my work day, which is how doing consuming the daily threat briefing. So that's what's up with that. You know, uh, obviously team replay, hashtag team replay is always going to be there. So hopefully you guys can giddy up on that. Thanks, Tony Roy. Uh, just a few minutes of jaw jacking uh, and then I'll uh, got a boogie to my own. I started, I'm working at uh, Haiku now. Uh, so I, I'm trying to get up to speed to be able to crush my first 90 days. Um, I'm still working with threat gen, uh, just in a different capacity. So... Thank you, Dennis, for being here. Genuinely appreciate it. Jared Pierpoint, hashtag Team Live. Good to see you. Oh, thanks, Gail. That's cool. Thanks, Shane Prevost. My pleasure. Uh, oh, Advent Sire got reset. I didn't know that. That's good to know. Guys, reminder, I will be doing Advent of Cyber um, on December 22nd is my day. Ooh, try Hack Me's down. That's not good. Is anybody else experiencing this? Try hack me is down. What's up, InfoSec kid? Crush it, Jerry. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Matt McDaniel. I appreciate it. ThreatGen and Haiku are not the same website. ThreatGen is a um is is a totally different company, a totally different product. Haiku from Haiku. Um Try hack me is good. Okay, so maybe it's just me. Hmm. I don't know what's going on, but I've I'm having issues. <laughs> I'm always having issues, yeah. Okay, so InfoSec kids seeing it too. Okay. Bad DNS, bad DNS. It's down. Okay. So, anyways, Advent of Cyber. Hopefully they get it sorted out in the next 16 days and you guys can giddy up on my um cyber thing. Check out this open chat. Look, look for the, I'm going to look into this, who owns the uh, intellectual rights to this blog post, and then I'm going to post it. I will say that OpenChatGL uh, wrote it initially. Thanks, Muhammad, for the sub. Good to see you. So try Acme's up. For some people, it's down for others. There we are. So advent of cyber it's a lot of fun absolutely free go check it out i'm i'm very very pleased to be uh, involved john hammond neil bridges insider phd cybersec meg security ninja husky hacks they're all there they're all part of it it's a lot of fun all right thanks jenny housley thanks carrie thanks justin gold guys uh this has been the cyber daily cyber threat brief um i'm jerry Ozier. genuinely appreciate all your time Guys, we will see you tomorrow 
at 8 a.m. Eastern time. And remember, tomorrow is Worldwide Wednesday, so we're going to run the continent and listen to some Daft Punk. So if you can, if you're international, uh, Australia, South America, Middle East, in um, Europe, uh, tomorrow's a, a, a big one. We want to run, run the... Uh, run the continents we got it last week and the the week before so we're doing good on it all right y'all thank you also very much for your time your patience your grace have a wonderful tuesday and we will see you tomorrow all the best everybody